In this video, I'm going to share with you five very dangerous false teachings that I believe are leading many Christians astray. Coming up. Okay, so false teaching number one is the King James only ism, right? And these are Christians who believe and they are convinced that the only Bible translation that Christians should be reading is the King James Version only. Now, where do they get that from? Let me give you a few reasons. First is an argument from tradition, and it'll say that the King James Bible was the first English translation in 1611 or so. And so because it's been around and been used and trusted for 400 years, this history of using the King James adds to its credibility. Second thing many people who are King James only will say is that some of them will go as far as to say that the King James translation was inspired by God, meaning not just the writers of scripture were inspired, but the people who translated the Bible into English were actually inspired by God as well. And therefore, that's why we should use this translation and throw all the modern ones out. Third reason is that many people who believe this will say that the manuscripts that were used to translate the King James Bible, uh, specifically the Textus, Textus Receptus for the New Testament and then the Masoretic Text for the Old Testament, these manuscripts can be trusted, but the manuscripts that were used to translate some of the modern translations to the English Bible can't really trust those, so therefore King James only is right. The fourth thing they'll say is that the King James preserves the language of the original text better than the other modern translations. Okay, so it's time to debunk this idea of the King James only. First and foremost, in the King James Bible itself, the translators have a note there where they basically admit that this translation is flawed, it can be improved, they hope it will be improved, and that it could very well be wrong. All right, now I'm going to read for you the note that's in the King James Bible, but then I'm going to paraphrase it for you so that it's a lot easier for us to understand. This is what it says. It says, for by this means it cometh to pass. Now already you're probably thinking, well, cometh to pass? Exactly. All right. That whatsoever is sound already and all is sound for substance in one or other of our editions and the worst of ours far better than the best of theirs. The same will shine as gold more brightly being rubbed and polished. Also, if anything be halting or superfluous or not so agreeable to the original, the same may be corrected and the truth set in place. Now, once again, what in the world does that mean? All right, so let me paraphrase it and say it this way. By doing this, anything in our translation that is already good, and we believe all of it is generally good, and even the worst parts of our work are better than the best of other translations will become even better, like gold that shines more after being cleaned and polished. Also, if there is anything wrong, unnecessary, or not quite right compared to the original text, it can be fixed and the truth can be made clearer. There it is, guys. Even the translators of the King James Bible admit that there could be things that are what? Worst parts of our work, that it will become better, it'll shine as gold, uh, like gold is being cleaned and polished. If there's anything wrong or unnecessary or not quite right, it can be fixed and the truth will be made clear, right? So this idea that the King James translation is infallible, even the translators didn't even believe that. Okay, second reason why we can debunk this is that Yes, the King James translation is a great translation of the Bible, but since that time, since 1611, there have been all kinds of um, um, uh, discoveries and uh, different manuscripts that have been discovered. For instance, the Dead Sea Scrolls and things like that, that were not available to the translators in 1611 that have given us more insight that many Scholars and theologians believe that the manuscripts that were used to translate modern translations like the ESV and the uh, uh, the New American Standard and the NIV are actually more reliable because they're older than the manuscripts that were used for the King James. 
For instance, for the Old Testament in the modern translations, right? Remember the ESV, New American Standard, NIV? Yes, they do rely heavily on the Masoretic text for the Old Testament, just like the King James did, but they also rely on other things that are like more updated, like the Dead Sea Scrolls or other manuscripts that have been discovered. So by using a wide range of manuscripts, you are ensured a more accurate translation. Third, similar to the King James, modern translations are translated by a team of people. Oftentimes, each person on that team has a specific area of expertise that they specialize in that hopefully guarantees a very accurate translation. Fourth, there are no major differences between the King James and the other modern translations that would change any sort of Christian doctrine at all. So this idea that we have the right translation and all the other translations are wrong needs to be debunked because at the end of the day, there's no core theological differences between the two. Fifth, modern translations make it a lot easier for people who may not be familiar with old English, right? Cometh, withereth thou, becometh thou, all that right, which I'm not against the King James, but it makes it a lot easier for people to read the Bible and understand it because it's using updated language that we use today, which then is encouraging people to have a much more fruitful and more consistent devotional life. Sixth, the King James only creates more division by creating a we versus us type of situation, which is not healthy in the body of Christ. And then finally, number seven, by using a wide range of different translations, it helps the reader get a better perspective like pieces of a puzzle. If I don't get it from reading this translation, I can read another modern translation and put the two together and get an understanding of what the Bible is saying. So the first false teaching that I think many Christians are being led astray by is this idea that many people are proposing that the King James is the only reliable translation. Hopefully we can put that to bed. Now, the second very, very dangerous false teaching is the new apostolic reformation movement or the NAR, right? And this is a movement that um, is championed by people like Mike Bickle from Inter uh, IHOP, okay, not where you get the pancakes, but International House of Prayer, all right? And then uh, people like Bill Johnson from Bethel Church and uh, different places, all right? And so uh, essentially they believe that the office and gift of apostle uh, is live and active today in the same way that it was during the time of Christ. So let's debunk that, right? Uh, first of all, there are no apostles today. Don't let anybody, don't let anybody, I'm saying this just as plainly as I can, do not let anybody convince you that they're, they are an apostle. No, an apostle by word, is one who has been sent from Christ, all right? So you, ha you have to have been sent directly from Jesus Christ in order to be an apostle, or you had to have seen the risen Christ. You remember whenever they, uh, in Acts chapter one, whenever they were replacing Judas because Judas fell off, right? What was one of the requirements? That these uh, people who were considered to be fulfill filling his shoes had to have seen the risen Christ, which is one of the reasons why God, uh, Jesus showed himself to the apostle Paul on the Damascus road, because if Paul was going to be an apostle, he had to be an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. Do you know anybody who as an eyewitness of Christ? No. All right. So therefore risen Christ. No. So that means that they can't be an apostle. Not only that, the Bible says in second Corinthians 12, 12, I believe, yes, that a Apostle must be confirmed by signs, miracles, and wonders. Now, I'm not talking about some of the stuff that you see today. I'm talking about being able to go around at will, like the apostles were able to do, and do straight up miracles, like raising people from the dead and healing people at will. We don't see any of those things today, which would lead me to believe that nobody who calls himself an apostle is truly an apostle today. Finally, if you just look at church history, right, the church has heavily debunked and rejected the idea and office of apostleship until more recently when some of these groups started popping up. So for the majority of Christendom, they didn't recognize that there could be people who are called apostles today, right? Because they recognized that this was a specific um, a specific uh, gift for a certain time. And when the foundation of the church was laid, 
right? Because that's what the Bible says. The foundation of the church was laid by the prophets and the apostles. We're not laying another foundation of the church. That's already been done. The apostleship office is done. It's done away with. There's no need for it anymore. And so because of that, there are no more apostles today. So the NAR would try to lead you astray. But another thing that the NAR wants to try to lead astray is this idea of dominion theology. And this is the idea that you and I as Christians, Christians need to take dominion in these seven areas or these seven mountains that they refer to. And uh, they call them the seven mountains, religion, family, education, government, media, arts, and entertainment. And they believe that it's the Christian's primary responsibility to take ownership and dominion of these seven areas. And once Christians take ownership and dominion of these seven areas, we will then make the world a better place and will usher in the kingdom of Christ when his earthly kingdom is set up when Christians dominate these seven areas. It sounds good on paper, guys, but at the end of the day, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible does not teach that the world is going to get better because Christians take dominion over these seven areas. No, the Bible actually says the opposite. It says in the last days, people are going to uh, go astray. It's going to be uh, bad times. People are going to be lovers of themselves and things of that nature. And Christ's kingdom is going to come in. That's what's going to purify the world during the 2,000-year millennial reign. It's not when Christians take us, uh, try to dominate in these seven areas, although we should be trying to be a light in the midst of darkness. Another thing that the NAR will do is that they try to convince you that spiritual warfare is the answer to everything. Everything is a spirit. Everything is a demon. And so all you need to do is get over your sickness. Just pray that demon away. Uh, this is a demon. That's a spirit, right? And so there's, there's an overemphasis on spiritual warfare, all right? And finally, and this is going to lead me into my third false teaching, they believe in what's called progressive revelation. And it's the idea that these apostles and these prophets are receiving new revelation from God that should be seen as authoritative and on the same level as the word of God because they are receiving new revelation. That's why it's called the new apostolic uh, reformation because just like the apostles and the prophets in the first century got revelation to write the word of God, here are these apostles today in 2024, and they're getting new revelation uh, from God that should be seen as scripture. And my friend, that leads me to the third false teaching, which is what I'll call progressive revelation. And once again, this is people who are always saying that I heard from God, I got this from the Lord, God told me this, and essentially, uh, it's this idea that God can speak to me in areas outside of the Bible, and what he has spoken to me is on par with the Bible in terms of authority. Now, let me make sure I'm clear on that. I'm not against God speaking to you, and I'm not saying God can't speak to you, but whenever you go as far as to say that what God has spoken to you must be adhered to by the church at large, the body of Christ, because what God just showed me is authoritative for the whole body of Christ and that it's equivalent to the power of Scripture, that's a problem. And that's why I said this is a false teaching. What does the Bible say? It says in Jude 3, Dear friends, I had been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share, but now I find that I must write about something else urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. God is not entrusting new revelation over and over again like some groups would try to get you to believe. No, he gave us the word and he entrusted this faith to us once for all. Now, why is this problematic to you? Well, first and foremost, it communicates the idea that God's written word is not good enough, that it's an old word, right? And we need a fresh word from the Lord. Have you ever heard somebody say, I got a new word. God gave me a fresh word. 
as if there's something wrong with the old world where we're treating it like the Bible is some sort of old piece of bread. It's stale or something like that, right? So, so when people, the reason why this is so popular is because people are so hungry for something new, something novel, something fresh, something that nobody has seen before. And they get so impressed with some of these leaders who claim to hear this revelation from God as something new. And it makes that person look and sound so super spiritual. And so many Christians are being led astray because they're so, um, uh, desperate for some new fresh word when at the end of the day all they need to do is go and read the old word because the old word is the new word second way it can be problematic is they can keep people oftentimes dependent upon this spiritual leader for insight because they say oh you know i can't make a move i can't do this i can't do that until i hear from my spiritual father my spiritual leader because they're ultimately hearing from god and so therefore i'm dependent upon them which leads me into the third one, and that's the fact that it can be used as a form of spiritual control and manipulation. As long as people see you as being the authority, they may not move forward in things, and oftentimes they might be led astray. A couple of more scriptures, 2 Timothy 3. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Doesn't include new revelation that might contradict the word of God. Hebrews 1, long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken past tense, not is speaking today in new ways, has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance and through the son, he created the universe. And finally, Revelation 22, 18 and 19. I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the words of prophecy written in this book, if anyone adds anything to what is written here, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. And if anyone removes any of the words from the book, from this book of prophecy, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city that is are described in this book. God says, look, you don't have to improve on this book. You don't have to improve on anything that I've said. It's already done. The canon is closed. The scripture has been revealed. Don't add to it. Don't take away. Okay. False teaching number four is what I'm going to call conditional confession. And this is very dangerous, taught by some groups that will remain nameless. All right. Uh, but this idea is this idea that you need to confess your sins in order to maintain your salvation, that if you die in a state where you have not confessed your sins, that your salvation is conditioned upon your confession, which is why I'm calling this conditional confession, right? You have to confess. You have to stay current with your sin. You have to stay up to date with everything that you do because you could be in jeopardy of dying in a sinful state where you have not yet confessed or repented of your sin. So in other words, it undermines the assurance of salvation. Now, if we could not have assurance that we are saved by the grace of God through faith, then why would John write this? Whoever has the son has life. Boom, that's it. Do you have the son today? Then you have life. It didn't say whoever confesses their sins has life. No, if you have the son, you have life. Whoever does not have this God's son does not have life. I have written this to you who believe in the name of the son of God, so that you may guess, so that you may think, so that you may be concerned. No, so that you may know you have eternal life. Is it possible for you to know that you have eternal life? According to John, it is. How do you know that you have eternal life? Do you have the son? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe the right things about Jesus, should I say? Because <laughs> you can believe about believe Jesus. Do you believe the right things about Jesus according to the scriptures? If you do, you're saved. Your salvation is not contingent upon you confessing your sins. Think about it. Do you think that God is so unfair that you could go an entire lifetime and serve the Lord with all your heart, use all your spiritual gifts, walk in purpose, and then at the end of your life, you have some sort of sin that you struggle with. Maybe you struggle with it for a day or two or three and get into a car accident and then you die. It really, do you think God is the type of God that is going to discount all of the works that you've done simply because you did not confess your sin 
to, to, to suggest that you have to confess your sin in order to maintain your salvation is salvation by works and not by faith. It's saying that you have to do something in order to maintain your salvation. It's saying that what Jesus Christ did on the cross was not good enough. It's saying that his sacrifice on the cross plus my works is how I'm going to get into heaven. It's his sacrifice plus my ability to remember every sin that I've committed and make sure that I stay current enough to confess all my sins. And if I combine what Jesus Christ did on the cross and my ability to confess all of my sins in a timely manner, then and only then can I be in the grace of God. It's a complete blasphemy of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that's why this false teaching needs to be rejected. Hebrews 10, 14, it says, for by that one offering, he forever, not he made you perfect until you confess your sins, he forever made perfect, made perfect those who are being made holy. Do you see the tension in this verse? He says, you are perfect. See, positional, this is why theology is so important. Positional sanctification means when God looks at you, he sees that you are right. This is positional righteousness. But there's practical righteousness. You and I are being made holy, right? We're in the process of becoming mature and, 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 and holy in Christ. But this is, this is practical righteousness, not positional righteousness. And that's why both of them are present in this verse. He says, he has forever made you perfect. That's the way God sees you. But in real time, you are being made holy. Now look at how Paul says it here. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave some of your sins. He forgave the sins that you can remember. He forgave the sins that you confess. He forgave the sins that you committed up to today. No, he forgave all our sins, past, past, present, and future. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Fourth reason why this idea of conditional confession needs to be rejected is because it promotes a thought process and a practice of legalism. Legalism is the idea that you never feel like you can operate with God as it relates or in a way of faith. It's always operating with God in a way of fear because you're not quite sure if the next step you take could send you off the ledge and you might lose your salvation. So everything you do in your Christian life is from a place of fear and not faith. And the fifth one may or may not be so much of a false teaching as much as it is a false belief and a false practice that is very, very popular today. And that's watching church online as if it replaces true in-person church. Since the pandemic, many Christians have gotten real comfortable in replacing watching church online with actually going to church. Notice how I phrased that. Notice I didn't say online church. I don't think there's any such thing as an online church, right? You can watch church from online, but church is all about coming together and fellowshipping. And I'm going to give you a few reasons why this belief, this practice of I don't need to be in church with other people. I can get what I need from God by watching it online all day needs to be debunked. First, the Bible actually suggests that if you are not part of a church, you could be living in blatant, willful, unrepentant sin because there's a command in the book of Hebrews that tells us to not forget or forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So let me just be very honest with you, all right? If you feel as though you don't need church, uh, then what you're basically doing is you're isolating yourself and you are removing yourself from a lot of the benefits that church has to offer, like community, like advice, like encouragement, like opportunities to uh, be held accountable, to have fellowship with other believers who love you and care for you and can provide for you. All of those are benefits that you have by being a part of a church. Not only that, 
The church gives you the best and easiest opportunity to use your gifts and serve. Now, can you serve in other capacities? Yes, I do all the time. The question is not can you, the question is are you? Are you actively using your gifts? Can you do it outside of church? Sure. But are you? Just like can you have community, godly community outside of church? Yeah. The question is not can you, the question is do you? Because what I have seen, and I'm just being honest, many people who don't go to church on a regular basis, they're living a solo life Christian. They're living a, a, a um um they're living church, you're living as a Christian on an island, right? Um, a private Christian life. And a lot of times they don't want the accountability. They don't want anybody in their lives. So they feel like, okay, I'll just go to church and I'll get my Jesus from church. Or excuse me, I'll watch it online. I'll get my Jesus online. But I don't need to be around anybody. And oftentimes that's just their way of isolating themselves so they don't have to be held accountable so they can grow spiritually. Now, I'm going to read a passage from the book of Acts that you're probably very familiar of. And I want you to count how many things in this passage that you can do simply by watching church online as compared to how the early church did church. It says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals. Can you share meals when you're not in church with people in church? Yeah, you can. Okay. Uh, including the Lord's Supper. Do you take the Lord's Supper at home? When you're not at church, when's the last time you took communion by yourself in at, at, at home, all right? And to prayer, a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, All and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. See, that's what the church is supposed to be about, sharing things in common. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need, Look, if you're not going to church on a regular basis, it's not right for you to go to the church and ask the church for money when you need it when you're not engaged in church, all right? They worship together at the temple each day. Are you worshiping God by yourself? Are you worshiping God together? That's not something you can do at home, right? Um, met in homes for the Lord's Supper. Are you meeting in homes with people, sharing a meal? shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people, community. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. From the way I see it, teaching is one of the few things, maybe prayer, that you can get from simply being by yourself and living a lone ranger Christian life. The rest of it requires that you get involved in church. Listen, I'm going to say this. And I know this might be offensive to some. I know this video is getting long, but I'll say this. It is very, very offensive to God when you say, I want Jesus, but I don't want the church. The Bible describes the church as the bride of Christ. That's his bride. The church is his wife. So when you say to God or when you say to Jesus, I want you, but I don't want your wife. Imagine how you would feel if somebody said that to you about your wife. Alan, with all due respect, I like hanging out with you, but I don't like hanging out with Sister Jennifer. I don't have any need for her. You wouldn't be on my best side if you said that about my wife, right? We come as a package deal. You like me, you like you want fellowship with me, you're gonna have fellowship with my wife. I think that's kind of the way it is with Jesus. You want fellowship with Jesus, you need to have fellowship with church. Okay, so hopefully these five false teachings will really help you discern truth from error and hopefully allow you to be able to live a much more vibrant and victorious Christian life. Let me know below in the comments if there's some additional false teaching that I did not cover that you want me to cover in a future video, and I'll talk about them then. And if you want to learn a little bit more about false teachings that are not covered in this video, I've got a book that I wrote last year called Misled, Seven Lies That Distort the Gospel and How You Can Discern the Truth. It will go into depth on all of these uh, different false teachings that I didn't cover in this video. It's written from a uh, part fiction, part nonfiction, part biographical, biography in terms of my life experiences as well. And I think you'll be blessed by that. I'll see y'all the next video. Peace.